Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Horsemanship Remark Show. It's still July 2023, and I know not everybody loves summer because some of you are having absolutely insanely hot weather, and I'm very sorry about that. However, I must say, I love summer, <laughs> and the weather around here has been just about perfect. Good morning, everybody. Yay, hello, Mike, Susan, some people I don't recognize, Peggy, Debbie's here. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Is Michael here? <laughs> I don't see his deal yet. You guys, I have so many ideas, and I thought that my notebook made it over here, but maybe after uh, Isaac, or <laughs> thinking about my little brother Isaac this morning, um, after Michael gets here, I'll grab my notebook. Rebecca said, oh, let's see. It's been awful here in the South. Yeah, I know you guys, a hundred, something absolutely crazy. I'm riding but listening as long as I don't lose service. Oh man, Rebecca, cool. Who are you riding? That's the most important thing, right? Um, Hello, hello everybody. So I have ideas this morning and we needed to hear what's going on with Michael because I literally have talked nonstop. Lynn, good morning. Everyone's being able to uh, listen while they're working horses. That's amazing because I'm sure a lot of you have to do it early in the morning. I was thinking uh, today would be a great morning also to uh, ride because it is beautifully um, chili. Lynn, I did read your message and I'm sorry, I just have not had time to, uh, type it back out, but I'm glad that the Bonnie videos have been helping you. Val, good morning. Somebody text Michael, find out where he is. <laughs> Although today is a day I definitely could talk the entire time. Speaking of Bonnie, for those of you guys that don't know, Bonnie is a little Yakima reservation, Mustang, I guess, or they call them desert rats up there. I have learned so much about the wild horses that are around me, uh, both on the um, Native American reservations and on the BLM here in Oregon. So I have tons to share about that, although I'm in not an expert at all. Uh, Aussie Thoroughbred, remind me your name. Uh, again, my five-year-old is foot sore, lame, and I can't work with her right now. Oh, that's, foot sore is annoying, annoying for sure. Gonna play with my senior mare. Oh, that's cool. Lisa, good morning. Oh, so Lisa, I have a question for you. Was Noah nickering at you when you had him a few years ago? Like, you know, let's say at feeding time or when you walked in the barn or whatever, because I was... Kind, actually kind of surprised that that started happening. Good morning. Yes, love seeing you with Bonnie. Oh yeah, Lisa. So you guys, we have this cool place really close to me. It's actually seven miles from me as the crow flies, but it does actually still take a half an hour because it's a lot of gravel. Oh, here's Michael. <laughs> Imagine that. And oh, his thing. Okay, let's add Michael and then I'll keep talking. Is it going to work? Let's see. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. It always does okay. It stresses me out so bad because I'm like, oh no. Nobody wants to see me talking to myself. I guess I'd be talking to them. Thanks for covering for me for three, four minutes. Oh, I could do the whole show, but I really want to hear what you have going on. Let me just finish this. this. <laughs> if I have anything going on that's exciting. Yes, you must be, and we have to hear what's going on with you because it cannot just be boring old me this whole time. Uh, Lisa says she don't rem she doesn't remember Noah ever engaging like that. So that's what Debbie said. But you know, some people say that just to make you feel better, which I guess you guys would not do that to me. Um, he is nickering at me, this rumbling nicker as as I come into the barn, which frankly surprised me. So, okay, so Michael, I don't know how much you caught, but let me just go back to this Paradale Trails deal. So I hope these 
kinds of things are popping up more all over the country. I've told you about this a little bit. So Perrydale Trails is a horse park that is privately owned. It's about seven miles away. It takes me 30 minutes to get there just because it's gravel roads. But it is a beautiful 100 acre playground, basically, for horses. And so Lisa and Debbie and I and Corey now uh, try to go over there a couple times in summer as best we can and take different horses. So this was Bonnie's first time over there last week. It was really fun. It's, it's I've, been, I've just appreciated places where it can go on a field trip with a horse and it's set up for success. So that means you can unload your horse. Well, you have a safe place to park. You can unload your horse and immediately do whatever needs to be done to settle your horse and then, you know, move up from there. So. Next. Well, I was going to say next time you're here, you should, you should go out on the trails and show you kind of how we're set up. I, I do like kind of some of the obstacles for clinic, but most of them, I pull out and take down because I don't want the yard to look like a playground, but we have quite a variety of trails and often there's, they're not bushwhacking, but often they're um, not blazed really well, but our crew around here has been very active getting out on the trails. So they're all like well-defined and well-worn. It's not like, is this the trail? Is this not? Cause it's just grass. But I, I really want to get, more obstacles set up out in the woods so I don't have to have, have them, you know, a pile of obstacles in the yard. But I feel like we're a pretty good setup for that. I'm just, just not fleshed out yet. What a good resource. Yeah, my favorite thing about Perrydale Trails, and you guys, she's on Facebook, that's where you should go to check it out. But um, so Michael, tell me if you're thinking along these lines too. To me, it's so much less about the obstacles. Like for instance, taking Bonnie, it was like blah, through the noodles. Like she looked a little bit at things, you know. Um, but she's not every horse is like that. It's a big deal to step on things or back through things or, or whatever, up and down hills. But being able to support your horse while your friends are coming and going, and while horses are all around over different terrain and like literally being able to have them go out and over a hill and disappear, mm -hmm. you know, or in and out of the trees and natural obstacles too, like, you know, a pond and, and things like that. So I guess all I'm saying is tiny bit too different. She has both there, but my favorite thing is being able to disconnect my horse from the group in a way that's a little bit harder in the woods when we go just because i mean you could i guess you could do it but the that's just smaller so if you have to do short serpentines or things like that you cannot always especially when debbie takes you straight up a freaking hill or down some stupid tr trail that's like you know like i said just a trace of a deer going through there a hundred years ago and Debbie's like, well, this is a trail. So are you thinking the same lines at your place? Well, we have, I mean, it's a little bit more, you're in the open or you're socked in in the trees. It's pretty thick, but we do have a lot of spots, meadows or spots where there aren't trees that the grass gets really tall. So they're not really suited for breaking out doing that sort of thing hanging out while a few horses leave and go around this little bend and come back but if we mowed them and made it more like a park we could mm -hmm. i mean it would be better suited for that and that's something something to consider but it's not i don't know i don't know if i want it to look like a park yeah. <laughs> as much as it's right Right. Yours is, yours is so beautiful. And I think there hopefully will be more people that will have a passion for creating places like this because it would be cool to have 
more, you know, all over the country, of course. I think it's a decent business model if you own the property already. Um, so, yeah, yeah, a very, very cool deal. And super cool that you guys have it right there. Yeah. I just am even noticing how fun it is, of course, to be able to, to do things in my round pen and then ride out in my little, mm -hmm. you know, open space and then up to the arena, of course, is, is nice. But especially being able to like drive somewhere and then the gravel roads are a bit of a shock to some horses too, you know, especially like Bonnie's only been a few places by herself in her life. And so, you know, down the road. Wash words. <laughs> yeah. So I'm coming, Michael, you know, I'm getting great for driving the trailer all the time, right? My little tiny trailer that I love so much. And so I'm going kind of like speedy because, and 25 miles an hour, you know, because I was feeling speedy. punchy. Oh, I hit, hit this washboard and I almost bit my lips off just. <laughs> Start, I was like, started your teeth out of your skull. Oh my gosh, just I was nervous. Okay, we have a couple. Uh, Bonnie likes you. Denny gives me that deep wicker. Oh, that's right. You guys call it a wicker. When I go up to feed or just call her in the backyard. Oh, isn't that the best when they, there's, oh, there's just this sound. Speaking of Bonnie, she literally has the best knicker in the whole world. Hers is better than Noah's, but they have a similar one. Then Debbie and Lisa are laughing at me, um, whatever. Uh, up those freaking hills and down the deer trails are my favorite is. <laughs> Val, you are much more brave. You and uh, all, all the gang, Joanne, et cetera, are, are brave. You know, I had this idea yesterday I haven't talked to Tom and Michelle about it, but they have land down near one of the state parks. And it's about, I don't know, it's an hour and a half maybe from here. And it's pretty much just raw land. They have what would be considered maybe a Jeep trail into a spot they have cleared for a tent. They haven't really developed it at all. But what if they, you know, put enough of a road in and then cleared an area that was just a, a flat parking lot pad and we could pull the trailers in, people could set up tents, it's all primitive. And we could take the whole farm down there. We were counting how many trailers we have because not everybody has a trailer and see how many horses we could get down there. That'd be pretty fun to have a weekend where it was just the, the bellwether crew trekking down there together. Oh man, that sounds amazing. Yeah. It's so fun. And you know what I was noticing with Bonnie too is like, be, it really helps to be there with friends that you are friends with because the way that you talk to each other, I feel like the horses notice. So if you're joking around and just talking about life and, you know, they hear that and it matters to them. Nicole, good morning. Oh, that's right. Right. Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. So, um, yeah that sounds amazing how many people would you guys have at the bellwether crew i didn't add it up and come to a solid number but it'd probably be at least 20. And, and a few a few folks that you know like jody doesn't board here anymore she's boarding closer to home but she's out here for lessons frequently and boot camp so she she'd probably meet us there. She has a two horse, she'd come here and pick up another, yeah. So between the bellwether and then maybe the up north crew coming down. Val and them. That sounds amazing. Yeah, and Val's saying that she's super picky about um, who she rides with, which is of course true to varying degrees. Um, I mean, it is totally true. It depends, and it depends on what horse you're on too. So Michael, I took Novella to a cow sorting. I saw that. That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> it's so fun. I wish I could do things like that every day. Oh no. What does Lisa say? Hold on, you guys. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Let's see. Uh, I imagine our conversations do matter to the horses. Mm -hmm. They're so dang sensitive to energy, body language, and I think the tone too, Lisa. 
like I really was thinking about that, like the tone of how we talk to each other and absolutely the body language, waving, joking, you know, the way we're sitting in our saddles, like all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. So Michael, the cow sorting. Uh, I took Novella and she'd never done anything like that. But as you know, she, her baby slayer is, is very mellow, mm -hmm. but you never know how it is. Yeah. So Lisa, you should come one of these nights because here's the thing. This is my farrier's place. It's only 15 minutes from me. He and his um, significant other have been doing lots of community things for years now. And they have their place set up really nice as well because they have a nice big parking area for, for as many trailers as you want in summer you know, in summer, then they have an arena that you can get to pretty easily, but it's flat enough, like around the trailers too, if you needed to do a little groundwork right away when you get out of the truck. Cause I didn't know, you know, I didn't know whether I was going to have to like dive right into an arena full of cows. I, I had no idea what really what it was. So you go from the trailers to a, an arena, not a, not a huge one, maybe a hundred by 150 or 125 by 150, something like that. And then on the far, far side, you had the two round pens, right, with, with the cows. And, and for those of you guys that don't know, I didn't know what the hell the cow sorting was, the way they had it set up. And I guess this is, I don't know if this is just one of many competitions, but you move cows from one round pen to the other. And essentially, you have a team of two and you see how fast you can do it. You know, novellas. Yes, because you know Novella you and I Well, we won for ourselves. <laughs> it wasn't an actual competition. Was, was there a win for yourselves? No, I'm just kidding. Well, so here's the thing. The divorce, it was really interesting because for those of you guys that did watch the divorce that I posted at Horseman chip insider with novella that was super handy because all i did in my little warm-up in the arena was just make the cows the sweet spot so we start at the far end of the arena and pretty soon she's leaning up against the fence essentially to the point where i was like well i don't want to mess the people up in there and then we just followed a broke horse through the cows and the only time she was a little affronted was because she's super short she did get whacked pretty seriously with a cow tail in her face, you know? So he's like, Ugh. like you know, and I can feel it through her whole body. Was, uh, that's interesting. Cause <laughs> the other day I was helping someone on the trail and keep their horse back. Cause they were just holding him back and, you know, whacked the horse on the nose, pretty much like a cow tail. And they're like, okay, you're gonna keep my distance. You don't want that with the cows. Uh, how big were these cows? It looked like from the picture, you sorted a little one, but were they pretty? No, so that's called the dirty. Had you, have you ever heard of that? The what? The dirty. The dirty. I'm not familiar with that one. No. Me either. So I know the people are looking at that picture of Novella and I with the cow behind us, like, you're not supposed to turn your back on the cow, right? Like all this. Okay, so the thing is, you have 10 cows in the pen plus a little one that's called the dirty. And you're supposed to leave that one in the pen, which makes sense, I guess, because otherwise then you would have nothing to sort the last one from. Mm -hmm. so, so that little buddy was the dirty, and he was probably like one-third the size of the rest of them. So he can squeak through easier. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, really, the, the first bunch was pretty mellow. That's part of what I don't understand. Everyone wants to explain to me how to move a cow. I'm like, if you guys knew how much liberty I've done with horses, you would have, you would realize that is not the thing. <laughs> the, my challenge is understanding how to, how much velocity and how to affect the velocity of the cow. Because no, even though... Yeah, it was a very mellow bunch because I understand how to, how to direct them and how to get them going, but how much to like keep them going so that you can direct them is the part that I really is just going to have to practice, flowing. but I can That's tell either. Yeah. Right. 
So even though the first bunch were super mellow, the uh, I see other horses go in there a bit jacked up and they moved four. <laughs> so, it's like, but I want to get a, a, one of these cows going and then I'll, I'll back off imagining like it's going to work like loading cattle into a horse trailer. It really doesn't 100% work that way. So anyway, but it was, it was it fun. And on the draw of the herd, it depends on the flight zone or responsiveness of the cow. It depends on the presence of your horse, you know, because a horse with a lot of presence can project out there, even for a dull cow, a lot further than, you know, your horse probably didn't have an uber amount of presence. Um, being her first time and being so little and it not being bred in there. So she might have had to get in there a little bit more, you know, do what, uh, what's the word? Evoke a little bit more presence from her and be like, okay, we're doing this. So yeah, lots of factors to consider there. But, but you know, my favorite part, and I guess this relates to the Paradale Trails thing and, and Val's comment about picking who you ride around. One of my favorite things is to be able to just be part of the community regardless of maybe where you come from. We were the only weighed saddle out of 20 something people. Corey and I were the only sets of slobber straps. I'm like, you know, I need to get out more because when's the last time I was the only weighed saddle anywhere in the universe, you know, around me. Right? And yeah. so to sit in this in the evening, you know, in the gathering gloom in summer with a bunch of other folks who are just there to hang out with their horses. Very cool. Yeah. So it's nice, I guess, Val, is all I'm saying is 100% agree with you. And I'm so picky as well, especially when I'm on a horse that I really don't want to learn to be herd bound. To me, that's my, my very, very biggest thing you know, there's that element, right? And then there's the, also the element of like, okay, now I'm going to be just a part of the gang and I'm on a horse that, that can fill in some of those mm -hmm. elements. So, um, I think a bellwether camp out every year sounds amazing. Now that I've said it, the cat's out of the bag, I'm going to have to deliver somehow. So cool. So cool. Caitlin, good morning. How are you guys doing? Dalton, Dalton and Caitlin. So. Uh, what, what else? Okay, continue. Speaking of herd bound, I had a horse in the clinic that was beyond herd bound. I mean, definitely the worst I've seen on this property. Maybe the worst I've seen anywhere oh. and yeah I guess she bought the horse and it wasn't much of a thing but all they do is trail rides the horse lives with the buddy trailers with the buddy gets out and follows the buddy down the trail fusses a little bit it's not worth it back to the buddy oh my goodness this horse was just beside itself and didn't have any resources really in terms of maneuverability and responsiveness. I mean, you're just, of course they're going to say, well, I guess I got to go back with my buddy because they didn't have any means of doing anything otherwise. So that was quite a thing. Um, at first I had her try to just kind of wait on the hindquarters, but the horse would literally go across the arena, sometimes actually away from her buddy, which is how beside herself she was like she because she couldn't see where she was going her head was on sideways and I'm just like just wait don't pull don't pull just wait just wait and the hindquarters would eventually sort of come through but then it was kind of whipping around front end would whip you know just a mess and um by the time she got where her friend was her friend was like elsewhere in the arena but she couldn't like it, it was bad so eventually I'm like, okay, let me, let me step off. Let me get on this horse. And I did, did some groundwork, got her brain with me from the ground, which she had done a little bit, had a little bit of success, you know, getting her horse to quiet down and not 
be a wreck away from the other horses but you know like first experience blind leading the blind horse and rider not really um having a hard time well a beginner trying to get a horse that's really troubled oh, you get a good handle on them and get them broke right get them responsive and quiet and you know, whatever especially when you're thrown into the deep end and your horse is beside themselves yeah like oh. so she got a little, little bit going i think i helped her out in the morning class but you know you can only push so hard on the student um while they're figuring it out so, so she didn't have the horse really where you'd want it before getting on and I frankly did not realize how much of a wreck it was going to be when she got on. Like I didn't, she had the hindquarters going a little bit. She could bend him, you know, whatever, but you get on and the, the bend just did not go to the hind leg. I'd never been asked of the horse. The horse was content to just motor on through it. And I think all she'd ever done was hold him back. And then, you know, he'd just be worried and antsy and dancing around until he got with his buddy. So anyway, she got on, it was kind of, a disaster and I was like well just wait and wait and wait and she did a good job of just hanging in there and but eventually it's like this isn't getting better you know i thought we'd give her a chance to just wait on the hind quarters and then we'll get a little more consistent and then the horse would you know go quite so far across the arena before he'd bend which was happening but the horse mentally was not changing we were getting to the hind quarters a little bit quicker so i took the horse again worked it from the ground I had to help some other people and kind of keep teaching. So I, Mike helped me, you know, spend a little bit more time on the ground, got the horse a little more um, consistent, you know, more time being settled and getting lost and getting settled and getting lost and getting settled. So, uh, so I could kind of continue to work with other people. Anyway, so then I get on the horse and it's pretty much the same thing, but I realized somewhat pretty quickly that the horse was almost learning to run off because we were waiting so long so i was saying don't don't do more don't do more don't tip him over and i didn't want her to do him more because she could have tipped him over particularly if she let him get going and then bent more in panic but you know a couple times of him kind of going sideways and me waiting for the hindquarters because I had it really good on the ground before I got on. I could connect to that hindquarter, float in the rain. She was with me. She'd leave. She'd come back, so on and so forth. Um, but I could get her back rather quickly and I had, had the hind end. So I got on and after a few times of her kind of running off their head sideways and me just waiting on the hindquarters to come through, I said, this is, there's a reason this isn't working. She's going, I'm fine to do this. Like, this is not bothersome to me. And, you know, I, whether I get all the way to my buddy or part way to my buddy, then I will move my hindquarters. I'm like, okay, so she's reinforcing the idea of running up. So what I ended up doing, which I, without kind of hopping on the horse myself, wouldn't have maybe advised her to do, partly because of her experience and partly because, you know, I didn't want to tip the horse over, um, is I, I kind of took the rein pretty strong right before the horse ran off. I kind of, I basically doubled him and like got to the hindquarters even if it was a little bit forced um, and, and kind of interrupted that I'm running off. So then we weren't running around the arena, but I turn loose and then we we'd seek out our buddy <laughs> and head to beeline there. But before she, she got anywhere, I just corner her. And uh, that, you know, obviously worked a little better. Um, and then I, when I did have her get back on, horse is way more settled. And I said, if you catch it, you can kind of double her. And it was taking less, you know, we were getting to the hind quarter a little quicker. I said, but if she gets going, you cannot do that when she's motoring off. So 
she kind of got the feel for that. It was a, it was a, it ended up being a pretty good ride. The next day, groundwork went better. I think I did a little bit with the horse, helped her get more precise. I said, I'm going to be pushing you because if you don't step up here, you're just going through the motions and not getting anywhere with this horse, making it worse probably because you're practicing trying to direct the horse and the horse is going, I'm going through the motions, but screw you. So I'm basically practicing doing this disconnected. So I kind of pushed on her quite a bit. She did a good job. She got a feel for really getting a deep bend, getting to the hindquarters efficiently, um, not letting it go too long, not letting the horse swing around. Okay, it's good. She goes to get on. I said, kind of do the same as yesterday. Give her the opportunity with just, you know, a feel bringing her around. But if you feel she's about to take off, just corner, don't let it go there. But if she gets ahead of you, you're gonna have to wait on her, so on and so forth. And it, it was going all right, but then the horse decided she wasn't gonna move when she asked her to move. So if she was near her buddy, because she wasn't as ramped and just feet flying everywhere, having to move, she was settled a little bit more. Then she started kind of backing up and fussing any time she asked her to move. Like, well, this isn't gonna work either. So I had her kind of say, no, you need to get alive. Well, the way she went about that created all kinds of life. We were back to where we were at the beginning the, the day before. So um, we kind of ended up repeating the day before, got her a little bit settled. At one point though, I said, I'm getting about as far as I'm going to get with where she is right now, unless I spend a lot of time putting more in here. So you do what you did yesterday. We're going to keep going with that. And then afterward, we're going to do a divorce. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you were dying to do that right away. Yeah. Well, it was, I told her, I wouldn't normally do this after a clinic because I got bunches of other things to get to, and this is maybe going to take a while but like we can't leave this horse like thinking so much toward her, her body and just kind of managing it like she needs to have it she needs to there needs to be a change mentally and there isn't really a it happens for a moment but it's not really a change it's a flicker away right you know you back a horse up they go back and they can you can release for a moment but they've never really committed to being back they've never really thought back even when you're backing them up so you're getting the hind quarters you're releasing for that but you never really let down or committed to the hind quarter yield anyway <laughs> when I, we first started the divorce i told her i don't think you knew your horse could go this fast did you because we were tearing around that arena and the the crazy thing was she didn't just bow tie and loop back and forth right where her buddies were she just went ripping around the arena like the whole arena and fast um i mean as fast as she could go and uh you know it was a while of that she used up a lot of her gas pretty quickly um you know you know our footing's pretty deep and and good and and good which is so like yeah. yeah so um yeah i mean and then it was kind of par for the course on the divorce um took quite a while ended with her kind of facing away from her friends opposite corner what was interesting too because you know i mentioned earlier she would have her head bent around and she kind of lose track of where her buddy was and she was drawn to a couple other horses it was mostly just i'm beside myself period right um unless i'm standing next to another horse particularly her buddy so when i did the divorce it was kind of a spread out thing because they were cleaning the stalls down where she had been stalled with her buddies so there was draw there at the end of the arena but all the horses were tied up 
along the wall. And so she still was mostly drawn to the end of the arena, even though all the horses were on the wall. Poor thing. Just. Yeah, just clueless, right? Um, so initially it was just kind of move away from there, but I pretty quickly had to say, but you can't hang up on this, this whole long side either. But even then it was almost like she wasn't aware there were horses there. It was it's such a good really, example. It was kind of bizarre. It's a great example of the horse needs help, right? Yeah. Like they do not know what is going to help them a lot of times where yeah. they're going to feel better. It's not like, oh, poor thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it went quite well. And it really didn't take a long time. I mean, it took time. But, and I think largely that was, she used up so much of her energy, like literally wore herself out fairly quickly at the beginning because she was just motoring around there. And what was, the other thing that was interesting is, like I've let, let a horse go when they're truly scared, like thinking, okay, this will peak out. And then it didn't really. And they kind of get themselves in a panic as they're running. She wasn't panicked and run, running because she was scared. Uh, how, how do I draw the distinction here? She wasn't scared that she was moving fast. She wasn't scared by the fact that she had kind of lost control and was going that fast. Like she had practiced that being worried about her friends, but she was still, I mean, it, she was obviously beside herself that she wasn't with the other horses. Um, but it, it was a different feeling than a horse that you kind of, you think, well, maybe this will peak out and then it doesn't. And then they're going pretty quick and you got to help them come back down after they're, they really got some, some motor pushing. Um, but anyway, so we get, I don't know, maybe three quarters of the way down to the other end of the arena and into that corner. And <laughs> I, I look over my shoulder and I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is the farthest from another horse. This is ever, this horse has ever been willingly. And that was just an, kind of a bizarre thought. I mean, we weren't a long way from horses, but she was there, I wouldn't say completely content. I mean, part of it was, you know, worn out, but she had decided to go away from the horse. By this point, she was like knowing, you know, starting to make decisions about going elsewhere. Um, it wasn't just a kind of a fluke that she moved away from him and I backed off and she's like, okay, I need a break. She was going, I know it's somewhere over here. There's going to be peace. Like, her brain had started to turn quite a bit, quite a bit before that. So she was going the pieces over here, making decisions to go there. And it just struck me like, this is new to her to even be away from other horses. You know, and we weren't even that far away, but she was just like there, not ready to rock it back over that way. So that was cool quite interesting and then you know I have that door in the far corner so I unsaddled her there and let her out through the like right out of that corner and then kind of the, 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 the corner by the, corner the big by the house. door by the house or by, oh, by the yeah house. there's that little walk through door so I let her out through there and I said bring your horses around like as soon as I go through this door grab a horse off the wall and bring them out the front. So I don't get out the front and now she's going, and now I'm alone and I'm out front and now you're on the ground and we're on the concrete pad. And then I'm having to make a whole nother thing. Like I want her to come through this door and go, oh, okay. Oh, but my, you know, moving away from my friends didn't turn into a wreck too. You know, when they were there when I thought they wouldn't be sort of thing. So they showed up, it went, you know, she came out, she stayed relaxed, it was all good. But then I had to have the tough conversation with them, which I don't like to. I mean, it's kind of, particularly in this case, I felt obligated to, like, 
it wouldn't serve them for me to not say something. But I don't generally give people input when they're not asking, you know, what is what are your thoughts? What do you think? But I basically said, if you were family, I would basically be saying you I'm not I'm not gonna let you get on this horse. I'm not it's your horse. I don't know you well. You're not a close friend, but I care about you and I don't want you to get hurt. And she's been hurt by a horse before. Actually the horse her husband was on had I had her in training some time ago and she had gotten hurt on that horse and you know, that horse had made it through, but now she's got this next horse that's likely to hurt her. And I said, you're putting your life in your hands. I said, it's one thing. I'm pretty um, optimistic at what can happen, the changes a, horses can, a horse can make and what someone without a lot of experience can accomplish over time. But I said, if your thing is trail riding and it's not getting out there and working working your horse and developing your horsemanship and trying to build a relationship with this horse and get it better and really working at it. If your thing is trail riding, I could take this horse for three months in training and get to where I could ride out on, on my own, you know, by myself and keep the horse with me, support the horse when I didn't, you know, when it got troubled and kind of make a go of it. But if you take the horse home and then go, well, let's go for our trail ride this weekend. And the only time I really, outside of feeding the horse and petting on him, ask the horse to do anything is when I pop it on the trailer with its friend and go down the trail with, two, three weeks with later. Friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, it's going to go right back. Like if within two trips out on the trail is going to be right back to being married up to that horse. If you don't up your skill, develop this, you know, comp, confidence in the horse and the horse's confidence in you and why not. So I said, if that's your thing, you need to get a different horse. This horse is not, it's just not going to be safe. If this is how she gets, and this is her emotional response when she's not with her friend. So I couldn't well, I tell. It was a, not a, it was not a comfortable evening for me because I couldn't quite tell I couldn't quite read how she received that. You know, they did say thank you for, you know, your opinion or thank you for, you know, being honest with us or whatever, but it, it kind of ended with, well, we'll have to think about that. Okay. I mean, that's, that's good. That's all I can ask for, but you know, and it's entirely up to them. And, they, and she made it through the other horse. In, in time, I don't know how she did, but, you know, beyond my training, it didn't talk to her a lot thereafter to know kind of how it moved forward. Um, based on how she came to this clinic, you know, two or three years later than when I worked that horse for, it didn't look like her horsemanship had developed a huge amount. So I can't imagine her maintaining what I did with that horse had to do with her horsemanship. I think it was just carry over from what I did until the horse kind of settled in. I don't know. So that was my interesting weekend clinic. I think it's a very- Everyone else, everyone else did great and she did great too. I mean, she hung in there, she tried, she made changes but the horse is just very extreme. Um, and it's not something that was gonna be fixed in a weekend or by a, a novice. So. I love the way of saying, look, if you were family, this is what I would, this is what I would say. I think that's a really, really cool way of saying it. And I know that you are 100% sincere in, in how you, and how you. So. And how you felt about that. But I, and just as your, your friend, I would say, and also knowing that it's difficult to have those conversations and knowing how truly optimistic you are about all of those things. Listen to me mm -hmm. first, Michael, mm -hmm. before you read those. 
It, it is the, remember I asked Buck this, at least equal to anything else that is dangerous with horses. And yeah, so. I was actually thinking of that. Good for you. Because, for, <laughs> yeah. Because when you ask that book, it's like, well, if they want to buck you off, it's like pretty dangerous too. And like, well, like this horse could have done as, I mean, you could have ended up in the dirt with a horse on top of you just as easily as you could if this horse wanted to buck you off. So yeah, it was not knowing how to manage it. It was extremely dangerous. And he did say, if you recall, that, that a horse wanting to buck you off is not more dangerous. Mm-hmm. Plus, if you're going to get bucked off, you're, you know, your chance of survival is better, I think, than if a horse gets so beside themselves that they fall down, smack you on the head, and, you know, like you said, lay down on top of you. I mean, anyway, we don't have to dwell on any of that. That's not yeah. the point. I'm just encouraging to you that um, good for you for putting their needs above yours, which is what you did. That's cool. And I acknowledge also that that's very difficult to do because a person might not know that at that time, but it's the right thing to do. So you have to sleep at night knowing you did the right thing. So, okay. You want to read those three? Sure. Um... And then I have a story about her bound. There's a few. Um, Taylor said, I really enjoy listening to both as I'm alone in my area with no one to ride with. I'm fine with that though. So that was we can prior to be your gang, yeah, Taylor. Be your gang from the world away. Uh, and then Taylor said, that's always so scary for me to deal with, even as a seasoned rider. Because it's dangerous yeah. layup. <laughs> and then I asked, when I asked Mike to help, his eyes got kind of big. I think he was thinking, you want me to get on this thing? I'm like, no, 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 just from the ground. You're good. Um, Val said, I believe a good trail horse is one of the most skilled horses out there with all of the unknown on a trail from footing to obstacles to animals crashing through to terrain. A good trail horse is a master. Yeah. Agree. And then... Lisa said, herd bound issues are so hard and so scary. Michael, you did the right thing being brutally honest with them. Yeah. I kind of had to be. And I think if they had been like, well, thank you for that. And, you know, you're probably, you're right. And um, then I would have felt just more like at peace with it. But if, you know, and I was at peace with it. I had to say something like, like you say, Lisa, but it was, when you can't tell what they're going to do with the information or like if they feel like, well, I was, I was asking you for your opinion. It's like, well, you kind of were, you're at my clinic, you know, so, but, so. And I have one other horse we could talk about, unless you have something you wanted to share about your horses. Well, I just wanted to add in regards to the herd bound thing and in regards to trail riding in particular, Lisa says, I had to give a friend the same talk about two of her horses. Oh, we'll have to talk about that. Interesting. Who, who, I wonder who she's talking about. Well, I think I know who she's talking about, actually. Anyways, it's never, it's never easy to do. And, of course, unsolicited advice we don't believe in. But yeah. at a certain time, there is, it's like, and like, like you said, they were at your clinic. So you, you. You couldn't just be like, good job. Now you're going to survive. Um, you want to read that one? Uh, Maddie said, that unfortunately for some, they don't realize how dangerous it is until something happens on the trail that they have to separate the horses. Emergencies happen. Yeah. Ugh. I told you, <laughs> and you've heard did, my hey, trail riding story. <laughs> she, she did admit that she's definitely been been kind of i don't know if she said scared for her life but i said like you gotta admit like this is not a fun experience riding this horse and it's not you don't feel safe 
And she did say something to the effect of, yeah, I've definitely been scared at times or something like that. Worried for my safety, I think is what she said. But. And Julie says, if someone is paying for your expertise, the advice isn't unsolicited. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I've been reading True Unity again for the fourth time. And it is always shocking to me how much there there is still in a book that a really good book, you know, that's there, but this relates to what we're just talking about. He was, you know, he kept talking. This is early in the book. He was talking about horses having a strong desire for a closeness with the person. And he has closeness in italics. And you guys know from talking to me for all these decades that I have not used that word. Of closeness, which is kind of strange considering Tom has been such a huge influence on me. But, but he was, and I'm paraphrasing a tiny bit, although I did put my book out, but he was, they have a strong desire for a closeness, but they also have a strong sense of self preservation. And he was describing how close those are is kind of exciting to think that a horse could have as much of a desire for a closeness with the person. That's what he was talking about. As that horse that was so beside themselves. That, that's it. That's well, probably. I mean, if you think about it, sorry, I should let you finish. What were you going to say? Well, I don't want you to forget. No, finish what you're going to say. Whichever gets fed is what, it, or that's not a very pretty way to say it, but what, but whatever we draw out, I think he says build on, you know, and we've heard that phrase, build on it. And, and I'm saying that dismissively, but I guess I'm just feeling it in a deeper way. It's like, if there is that, that strong of a desire for close, because what you're describing is is that horse's sense of self-preservation just raging like a forest fire of tens of thousands of acres like so much power so like it's almost unbelievable what if the desire for a closeness to the human could be that and we can we can we can think about those extremes in our thinking time but but in the in our daily practice, the awareness of which we're building on because the potential for that raging forest fire of self-preservation is always there. It's just how, you know, is it on fire? Is it not on fire? But if it gets set on fire and depending on how much tinder there is, it is, it is there. So that's what he was talking about right away in the book is he was talking about the fact that those two things exist well and the thought that crossed my mind is they're kind of in a i mean there's a lot of self-preservation can be other than buddy sour so you know there's other facets but if we're talking about being herd bound and and a desire for close closeness with the human it's the same thing it's closeness security with something if that's if that's the feeling of the need for self-preservation causes you to want to be with your friends that's the solution to your you know need for self-preservation if that becomes the human the desire for the closeness of the human you don't have that being a factor in the need for self-preservation there might be other things you might be scared of you know some drop that you don't know how deep it is into water or whatever you know something might startle you as you come out of the trailer but it's not a i need to be with my buddy it's i am close to you you're going to help me through which is 
which is what we're after. True. I would have to add though, everything you said, hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think that he is also alluding to something that we've talked about, which is a spiritual closeness that I don't know if they, I don't under, I mean, I don't know that we'll ever know what goes on between horses, mm -hmm. but, but they're, but they're craving for a spiritual closeness to the person, which I think probably cannot be reached unless we're serving all the rest of their needs as well. Um, but I, I just think it's cool that that was layered on top of just being able to provide them safety and comfort and even peace. Like I should grab it. You want to keep talking while I grab it? Well, sure. It makes me think of, and this is maybe moving us off topic a little, not off topic, but it makes me think of, you know, the sappy story, you know, feel good shows where the chimpanzee and the puppy grow up together and they're best of friends and then the one dies and the other is just morose and mourning for, for so long. Is that a, that a spiritual connection on some level? And then, you know, you could have that between maybe two horses and they're not necessarily herd bound. There's just this kind of deep connection between the two where they can be peaceful being away from one another. They can, you know, be your, your riding horse, your trail horse, your, you know, fairly advanced horse, but they're, you know, and, and they're content hence being away from their friend, but when they get back together, there's a closeness that doesn't have the sense of desperation or urgency that you'd have with herd bound. So I wonder if you'd call that some sort of spiritual heart connection that's beyond just we're pasture mates. I, th just a thought. I think, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing th that situation. Uh, yeah. And I, and I'm thinking too, like of other animal pairs that I see, like horses, uh, excuse me, cats, you know, I have two cats that are definitely more than just coexisting, you know, and yeah. Interesting. So you guys, this happens to me, probably it happens to other people too. I have no freaking idea. My house is only so big. <laughs> Where I put all that. So I guess it wasn't meant to be. I'll have to. I'll have to check it out later. Okay, so what are our comments? Okay, Taylor said I had the same thing. I think back to the commenting on whether this horse was a good fit for them. Um, she said I have the same thing happen at a clinic I went to, and the host of the clinic was nearly trampled four times in two days of the event. Um, yeah. Uh, and then she said, I had that with my 15 year old partner, Red Gelding, my OTTB mare at 19. She wants that relationship. And my five year old mare has fought for it for four, four years. So just looking for that, that connection. Um, and then Val said, hierarchy of needs reminds me of Maslow's list. Hierarchy of needs safety, comfort, shelter, mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. Oh, then she has it listed here from bottom to top, physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging needs, esteem needs, and self-actualization. Yeah, the funny thing about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is you always think, um, is I've never found anything that would, would lead you to believe that 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 his order was not 100 percent correct it's just funny how it all happens together essentially too be, just because in any given moment all those needs need should be attended to right 
um, if that makes sense. And the closer you get to self-actualization, let's say the, the more all the plates are spinning, obviously. So yeah, it is, it is very, very, very interesting. So a note on trail riding though, um, because it is one of the most fun things really in horsemanship, uh, I think in, in have, for me, but it's funny because most people think I don't like trail riding. We've had this discussion before, but that has nothing to do with how amazing it is to be out in the woods or I would assume on a beach or in the desert or like obviously duh who doesn't want to be horseback and out in nature but i would also just reiterate what you're saying which is it is the place to make your horse the most herd bound which essentially is what we're saying is trail riding is also the way to make your horse the most dangerous talk about two things existing at once yeah which is why unless you're intentional or like you say that prairie dale is that yeah and i have so this, this is my story this is this is my yeah good job <laughs> prairie dale so in the when you get there she has the playground really really close to the trailers um she has a like a flat spot no footing but it's it's an arena style you know style 100 by 100 something and a round pin in the trees and tons of obstacles and then when you go go out over the hill to the big wide open spaces and then you can get to different forest places and a pond and like all sorts of more cool things a forest and everything but you have to leave that and kind of go over the hill um, um and away and i got there late if you guys can imagine that so the girls my pals were already had spent a good amount of time getting their horses with them and you know all warmed up however we say that that doesn't mean physically warmed up but but with them and so bonnie and i got there for the first time and really it's her and i's first first time riding out in big open spaces ever okay so she was great that there's lots of things that that because she trusts me it's really cool with her because she's the one that made me say when a horse is going to be right, let them be right. Because I can feel that teeter in her so much between you could tip her over into a sense of, you know, just really being concerned about her safety, but she's so in the, in the middle that I can easily convince her to stay that I, I can handle handle it because she, because we've never had a situation where I've let her down, which of course is, I just, just try to block that out because you could be, I could be stressed about that. But for the most part, you know, I've been able to show her. So she's quite willing to follow my lead. But also, you know, she is a very goey horse and she certainly was aware that we were in a new place and horses that she knows were there. And so, of course, there, there was a tiny little bit of awareness and draw to these other horses, a little bit. But she was also with me, plenty good enough. But we just, you know, did lots of serpentines and changes of direction, not in an emergency, but just so that I could continue to be the one directing her feet as her mind went all over. But at a certain point, this is the point I'm getting to, at a certain point, Debbie in particular was like, hello, I'm ready to go, right? And now she's waiting on me because my horse is not ready to go because she would go and be safe to ride, meaning she wasn't going to try to ditch me or anything, but she would have married up to the horses. That is what would have happened, right? And so I had to tell Debbie and Lisa, go ahead. And I was ready you guys seriously to put my horse back in the trailer if need be and leave they would never it's not like they were being rude or 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 overly pressuring or whatever but that's how serious it is to me that in that situation absolutely not do i marry my horse to the other horses forget it i'm not flushing years of spending with this horse down the toilet 
because I have to go with, forget it. I would go home. I would go home. That, uh, no way. Mm -hmm. Now, as it turns out, it was fine because I also know I can get off and manage the situation if I needed to, but which didn't happen at all. Uh, and Corey, Corey kind of stayed with me for a little while because her horse wasn't 100% with her either. So we kind of hung out together, but then her horse was with her before Bonnie was with me, even though probably from the outside it looked like she was and this goes back to what you were saying about that horse even though it wasn't that far away from the other horses it was the first time they really mentally had disconnected that's what you were saying right so mm -hmm. i so i had bonnie's feet from the second i we got off the trailer i had her feet but not her so even as things progressed, it still wasn't right. And so I was like, well, you know what? I think I'm just going to do the divorce right here. Just a little bit, you know, my, my safe version of, of doing the divorce. And I'm going to make that shady spot. It's kind of hot, 90 something. So in the full sun, it was hot. You know, I'm going to make that shady spot opposite to where you guys went over the hill. Um, my, my target. And so Corey was like, all right, I'm going. So she goes to leave. Bonnie does this straight to the shade and parks it. I'm like, it's so creepy. It's so creepy in the sense that I don't know how she knew that. Cox a leg. I'm like, well, let's go then. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I pet her. Like, I didn't jump her out of there or anything. But I'm like, Corey, wait up. And off we went. Mm -hmm. But it, it can change, like that decision for her development, I was so sure about. And especially in a situation where I could make that decision. Like obviously if you're 10 miles into the woods and you all have to leave before dark or something, that's just not a thing, you cannot do that. But, but in this particular situation, I absolutely could have said, you know, we're going home. And I mm -hmm. would have. Luckily, my friends are cool. So, so speaking of your cool friends. Yeah, like, would you read all those? Lisa said, I totally agree. Emma, trail, trail riding can make you or break you. You have to set it up to not cause your horse to become herd bound. I knew Bonnie would do well. And then and I wasn't ready to go out either. Benny got too aware of Debbie's heading off, so I waited until Benny tuned into me instead of Debbie leaving. And then Diana said, I have wished on many occasions and I had put my horse in the trailer and gone home. I should have. And yeah, I, I, it's hard. That, it is really uh, hard. Taylor said, this is a lot of why I ride alone for these reasons yeah the, the cool the cool part though is when you do have like-minded people which is of course really cool about michael's gang in wisconsin is just because you have you have many many people that you guys have all come together to in, in a way that is just super cool and i think we're building that same thing you know here too but but just the awareness of her bound the, to wrap this up and then we can talk about your horse unless you guys have something else that you wanted to ask or add please do but the grave seriousness of allowing a horse to become herd bound or vigilantly hmm, well, I don't want to say prevent or whatever but but drawing the horse to you vigilantly drawing the horse to you so that it doesn't happen and this is a grave decision and should be treated as such it's not just like what kind of outfit am I wearing? <laughs> no. This is life and death, you know. Well, then it's interesting too how much, like, there's degrees too. Yes, 
Her, like, her cannot boundness can just be an inconvenience. What's that? Her boundness can yeah. just be an inconvenience. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying getting the horse with you. Like, you get their mind. And, and you guys, for those of you that have been watching Bonnie and are like, how, why, how is she so far along? That's why is because for whatever reason, probably freaking luck. All of those pieces are coming together at one time. The mental, emotional, and spiritual pieces are somehow integrated to what to her in a way that a lot of horses that I've spent time with in that you guys have seen me with have not been like that. So the reason it's jumped from just getting the horse with me physically to this a little bit like, like holy cow, how is this all working? It's because those other pieces are just like raindrops falling right, right into the same place. And I really hope I cannot screw it up, but I just have to do the best I can and not get bogged down worrying that I'm going to separate those four things. But that is why it's working. That is why it's so surprising. Mm -hmm. Because it's not always the case, <laughs> you know, for, for lots of different reasons. Is that what you were going to essentially say that the horse being? No, the degrees of getting them with you, like getting them physically in the rectangle. Like you said, sometimes it's just the time you have or you know, it's about to get dark or whatever. But I think of like um, Rebel in an arena, it's raining or, you know, times where all the horses have left and Buck spends his time working at the gates, just doing figure eights, waiting until that horse is on committed to the United Circle. And then when you go to leave, I don't know, I, do it a lot too do it all the time if you feel that when you go to leave the horse might, might physically leave at a walk but their brain is still pretty quickly goes okay I'm, we're going so they've mentally they're not in this like spiritual connection place where i could be here all day and i don't care about going back to the barn but they are ne they're obediently staying in the rectangle and you have their mind far more than if they just like shot out of there and we're taking you for a ride and you know so there's degrees of you know i, I don't know what to say about it more than that, that because we're talking we're talking about extreme like getting the horse extremely with you and the ideal of having them 100%, not just physically in the rectangle. And that's what's ideal and we could say necessary to not creating a herd bound, the, like the flicker of a herd bound idea, right? Yeah, I yeah, that's where you have to start, but of course, it's easier and faster if you, if you can hunt up the rest of it. Yeah. And that's another right. thing. Right, get go. Yeah. Yeah, or like pretty at least be aware of the fact that there's that there is a feeling when it is the whole thing, the mm -hmm. whole horse is with you. Now, of course, that, that priest supposes that we are with them. That's another thing that could have happened. I could have been obsessed with where they were, what they were doing, how embarrassed I was, that I, which I was not. But, you know, I can imagine being embarrassed that I, that I wasn't able to ride out or, or can, worried for my safety or just like I was not. So there's, a, there's an element of that as well. But it just just having it on your brain that there's a that there's a wholeness that is unmistakable and yet you're you know i think the point you you make me think though that when is good enough because sometimes there is a good enough just having the feet with you for the day mm -hmm. yeah he was so, Tom is funny in the book when you guys read it. I know a bunch of you guys are going to reread it now. 
<laughs> that you'll come across the part where he's like, people are just so close to it. They might as well just get the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, they could just be just right near it. And they might as well just go the extra mile, you know? Anyway, we have comments. Comments. Oops. Comments. Okay, there we go. Okay. Julie said, this is just yesterday, we had a four horse surprise with a dog in the tall grass yesterday. And all four riders got the horses settled in with them in moments. It was a great deposit in the bank. That's pretty funny. Sadie went running through the woods and I think, I don't know, one of the horses kind of startled at it. But she chased something up. So, like, she jumped into the woods having heard it and then everything went quiet for a moment. And then she must have, like, actually found it and stirred it up. So then there was even bigger kerfuffle. Like as it ran out of the woods and she darted after it. So one horse is spooked the first time and then the second time it happened, like right soon thereafter and it was louder, all the horses jumped and kind of wheeled to look at it. But it was it was just that, it was like there and gone. And then we all walked off like it didn't happen. It's kind of cool. Super cool. And then Taylor said this is wonderful. I was so glad it was resolved so quickly. I lost connection to Uh, oh, she lost connection. Okay. And then Julie said, good horses and good riding companions. For sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so what about your other horse? Well, what time? Sorry. It is 10 minutes till. Not, not enough time. Uh, uh, okay, well, tell us I'll, the... I'll, I'll tell you so we can come back to it. Uh, is trailer loading... And I was thinking of Bucks loading that horse at the OW. And I saw a clip of it because Nicole had recorded it for the Buck channel and ensured. And she showed me just a couple minutes of it and just watching just that small, small snippet planted seeds in my brain as I was working this other horse. Um, you know, just coming forward and going back, moving the hindquarters just a little bit. And the whole thing that was rolling through my brain is set them up, get them prepared for, for you know, whether it be stepping in, stepping out, coming forward, coming back. So that's my cliff notes. That's what was in my brain. And it, As you were trailer loading. As I was trailer loading this horse that it pulled back, broke the halter, and kind of rocketed out of the trailer the morning. What kind of halter broke? It was a, a web hold, like, you know, leather halter that's meant to break away. And probably, so what I think happened, yeah. The, you know, there's the stall in a slant load like here and the horse is tied back here. There's a fairly short trailer rather than being, being tied up here. So the horse felt the feel much later. Like, so they put her in or him in, tied him, and then they went to leave and the horse was kind of leaving with them, not realizing he was tied. So he started backing up, probably rushed a little bit because he was anxious but then was committed to moving before he felt the feel on the halter because there was so much slack in there because he wasn't tied far forward. And so I don't know if he was stepping down right at that moment in a way, it's probably good the halter broke rather than him being halfway out of the trailer and then pulling back and being a wreck. But anyway, I've actually, I've seen that before. And it's an interesting thing to know, you know, you hand your horse off to someone and you kind of got to like disconnect the horse or say, I'm leaving you're with them now, sort of thing. I've seen it a number of times, someone tying the horse up and they'll tie the horse up and they'll go to leave and the horse will think they're going with them and then suddenly hit the rope. I think that's what happened here. I've actually seen um, it happen that the horse ended up pulling back because they were just like that committed to I'm going with you. And then they hit the end of the rope and kind of surprises them. Now, obviously it'd be great if they were 
you know, following a feel enough that even when it surprised them, they went, oh, okay. But something to be aware of if your horse is not real good at coming forward off the rope. And he was, when I started working with him, there was a little block there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was great. Like, there was definitely a resistance there, but it didn't take a lot to get through. I was just, you know, a little bit of time going forward and back, some, re, you know, a little bit of tap with the flag saying, oh, come forward off of that. Um, and then when, when we gotten quite good at coming in and out, you know, hind feet coming up and down was the, the biggest thing. And then just being quiet in there when the divider shut, like, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about it next time, but you could tell he was good at following a feel because I put the rope up through. She had a little piece of twine rather than the ring, which I just used the twine. So I put it up through the twine and had the tail of the rope and the weight of the rope was pulling through the twine as I was kind of closing the divider, encouraging him to stay, petting on whatever. So his nose was up in the corner in the top of the trailer because he didn't want to pull on it. And the lead rope had shortened up so much as the weight of the rope had pulled it through the, through the ring. So he was definitely trying to follow that feel. So I think as much as anything, it just caught him off guard because he thought he was back in the trailer with him. Probably a little bit rushed about it. And suddenly he hit the end of that rope, maybe right as he was stepping down. But anyway, they got him in the trailer, got him here. And then I spent <clears throat> a good amount of time trying to get him good. But the, the biggest part was how what does it mean to prepare them to step back? Because he knew where the edge of the trailer was, but he wasn't thinking about setting his foot over and down because he'd done it a number of times. And when he did get that foot down, it wasn't like set the foot down and snap it back up. Like I'm panicked to put my foot down or that foot's down and then I'll scramble backwards and almost tip over. It was like once his foot went off and down and touched the ground, we were pretty good. And I, it was a pretty good drop. I was I didn't make it easy on myself by having it be a, sh a short drop. I it was parked on a bit of a decline. Anyway, um, what was I even saying? Uh, oh, so it was, you know, it's where they get their toes right on the edge and then their front feet back up, and then you're really tempted to just push them out of the trailer, um, which I guess is kind of, kind of what had happened at the OW, the, the horse had kind of been forced out of the trailer a few times and that's where he, she was really sticky. I talked to Nicole about the video. So I, I had the inside to be able to hear more of than just that clip she had showed me. Um, so she kind of described it, which was super helpful just to have some ideas on what, how Buck was handling it, and what he was looking for, what he was feeling for. But what I, came to uh, with thinking about that video um talking to nicole about it was the idea that preparing is like not letting him get to that precipice and hang his toes on it like if we were gonna go there it's lead him forward and reset and back up again until one foot lands close to the edge and the next step could clear the edge of the trailer and step down. But if he took like a uh, step that leveled his feet up and just caught the edge of the rubber there with his toe, it's like, nope, come back. We're not gonna let you just hang off the edge and then fall off this and make it worse. So a lot of forward and backward saying, okay, get your right foot right on the edge to where your next step could, if you committed, drop your left leg off and set it down. And when I started kind of not letting him hang off the edge and got more clean steps in a row where I said, unless you're reaching off and letting that hip drop to drop that foot to the ground, we're not gonna do this. And that seemed to, to make it, to get us a change. The other thing which I was kind of doing before talking in a Cole that I you know, always emphasize is come in with one foot back out, come in with two feet back out. He was having a hard time and I didn't quite get to where we could come in with three feet 
back out, but he was coming in obviously thoughtful with those hind feet rather than rushing them in. And we kind of called that good for now. But the, the preparing, getting the feet set up to where, you know, where it was, where it was logical that if you asked, they were in good position to reach off, off the edge of the trailer. Uh, I don't know. And then I started thinking, well, how much of it is just forward and back and how much can I be doing laterally to move the hind end to shift it over and get prepared that way, get the foot closer to the back, to the, to the step down. So uh, that's the, the cliff notes and maybe all I need to say on it, but it was mostly just fun and interesting because I had neurons firing, having just seen that short minute or two of Buck working something similar. And it makes me just want to see the whole process and try to study it and go, what is he doing to prepare? What did preparing look like? Um, but just that little bit and then talking to Nicole, she described a little bit more of the lengthy process, what she saw. So it was, it was fun to work on it shortly after having seen that and talked to Nicole about it. That's all. I know. I wonder, I don't know if Nicole's going to edit that or I'm going to edit that. Um, either way, hopefully we'll get it done sooner rather than don't, later. Don't, don't edit too much out. Well, well there, I mean, <laughs> isn't so there long. three hours worth or so? Yeah, there's, I don't think hosting it is even, I don't know, maybe. We'll see. We'll deal with that later. But yeah, I'm excited to see it too. Yeah, trailer loading. I think so that's another thing that Bonnie and I are going to need to, um, you know, I was thinking about talking to Kip last night about making a saddle horse. And there's a difference between you kind of have these multiple stages. Obviously, we think about a snaffle bit, a hackamore horse, two rein horse, and bridle horse, or, you know, a snaffle bit, and then a, a double bridle and dressage but also i was thinking about the difference between a colt and a and a saddle horse and there and i suppose would you say that making a saddle horse is just finishing the snaffle bit stage Pro probably but yeah I, I guess getting getting to where you have their feet enough to to get a job done, you know. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Although you know, you see people. Flora, are you here this morning? Using her yeah. colt to do a yeah. job. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't consider that a saddle horse. I don't know. We we need to, I guess, maybe think about a word for it. Um, or, or a meaning for it, but I just was thinking in terms of like Bonnie, let's say, moving her from a colt to an actual saddle horse. What does that mean to me? And one of the things is, you know, how solid is she getting in and out of the trailer? She, she, she doesn't know anything other than, yes, I get in the trailer. Yes, I get out of the trailer. But loading in and out of the trailer over and over again, multiple days, going different places with rhythm, all of the things that you're talking about, because she did have some hesitancy as I started backing her out of the trailer. And I don't do that at first because I've done trailer loading all sorts of different ways. Um, but there's, to me, there are two different distinct components of the horse trailer. Um, one of them is loading and unloading and standing in the trailer. I would say that's one category. And another category is going somewhere in the trailer they are different and so sometimes like with bonnie for instance loading her into a nice open stock trailer changing you know going in and out it's plenty big enough for her to turn around in and out in and out in and out till she can stand there with her nose in the corner i just loop the you know loop the um, 
leave rope out the door so that I can shut it and then I tie, you know, them in. That's different than being able to back and forth, back and forth, nice and straight, stepping down quietly with both feet, all the things that you're talking about. And so I would say that I could definitely get her from A to B very reliably, but she is not saddle horse check offable in that, you know, in that area. She's a cold. She could go, you know, she could go somewhere. She could go somewhere and she could get it done to flag colds or even to, I don't know, maybe it's the, the degree to which they can handle trouble. I mean, yeah, I'm, you gotta make your, you gotta make your definition up, you know? Yeah. Anyway, something I've been thinking that I about I think that making a saddle horse is getting them to a reliable horse to ride even if they don't know all the snaffle components yet they are reliable saddle horse now, i don't know if you can get them reliable without understanding everything that's in the snaffle bed stage But I do think you could have a horse that could technically do all the snapple bit things. Certainly in an arena. And they wouldn't, maybe that's what Buck's trying to say. Huh. Is, you know, if they can't do a job, maybe that's what he's talking about. I don't know. I just think about the difference between my string now and having horses that are, that are basically at three different stages. You know, really culty colts. Or for the most part, mine are all started under saddle here. I don't have anything that's not started under saddle, but they're still like super, like I would say Rook for instance, or uh, even Noah and let's, Noah's a good example because he's been ridden a good amount by me and, and other people, but he's just still a cult because there's, humongous holes in what he is doing and can do and then i have saddle horses here and a few like i would say zorro and obviously your horse katniss absolutely a saddle horse right can get she for sure right and then of course i have vivian so who, who is a bridal horse without a doubt so it's interesting to see that cat or feel that category emerge. And that is specifically coming from horses like Bonnie that are moving from moving out of being a colt into feeling like, okay, this is a saddle horse that I could teach off of that I could, you know, that is reliable to go places and in an emergency could help me with things, moving horses around or dragging firewood into the house, I guess. So maybe I'm just saying do a job. I don't know. I have done that before. That's why I'm saying it that way. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's something you just have to. I disagree, Lisa. Every, everyone can make their own definition of it until. Mm -hmm. That's true. Until some group of, some group decide well this is our, what we she's frozen say, saddle horse. Oh. say it one more time michael oh i said you know you kind of make your own definition until some group like say we said okay this is our definition and then take it or leave it you don't you can have your own definition but this is what we mean when we say saddle horse but i don't know that we have a definition yet Right. It's just something that carry on, whatever. Because what? like you say, in theory, you could have a colt and get a lot of those things done. Go move some horses, go, you know, drag something to the house, go open a gate, go, you know, hurry off and do something. You know, get in a trailer fairly reliably. Does, does that make them a saddle horse? I don't know. Yeah, there's a solid Solidness, maybe that I that I'm thinking of or feeling like some sort of solidness, some sort probably, of seasoning. Probably, yeah, seasoning a degree to which the horse just knows, and you're not needing to support them. They do it on their own. 
and know the job more than a Colt would. Yeah, Maybe. and has done it more than just one time after they've, you know, been really set up for it. Yeah. But yeah, something like that, but not yet super refined, maybe. Even though this is exactly what I'm saying, Lisa, I'm dissatisfied with the idea that that you could have a saddle horse without being able to do haunches in, because haunches in is like a total no-brainer, right? If, if a horse can do all five methods of yielding the hindquarters, which of course they should be able to do. I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to talk. Um, so right away, my knee-jerk reaction would be, not uh <laughs> But I suppose you could drag firewood into the house and, and move cows and get horses and flag horses and all the things without being able to do. I don't know. You need to be able to move that horse every which way with no blockages. I don't know. We'll see. The horse is adjustable and understands it all. There's no needing to wait on them to find the answer. So who who is this that just said? Duo horsemanship. I'm not sure. What is your name? Uh, I don't have lead changes on my best horses, but I can still flag colts and work cows off of them. Yeah, I know the flying changes is always the question, right? It's like, and I would agree that does a horse that does not have flying yeah, changes. Emily. Yeah. Emily. She's on her business. Oh, she's on her business account. Yeah. So yeah, the flying changes is, is definitely a, question we should additionally talk about just because a horse can have flying changes if they're out in a big space you know and just changing direction doing something bringing horses in or or cows or getting from a to b or whatever you could have flying changes in, in an arena in a super fancy way um could have flying changes over jumps do we even need the flying changes because buck says just to start on flying changes at the end of the snapple bit stage what does that even mean? Because it means different things to different people. I, though, would agree that a, at this point, I, I would say absolutely you could look at your field of horses. <laughs> For those of us who have a field of horses. <laughs> and be like, those are the, you know, I need a saddle horse. Who should I get? You know. And, and Novella is getting just getting close to that. Like, oh, let me get one of my saddle horses. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's the, the simplest way to find the criteria. And you look at your group of horses and you go, that's the one I'm going to get. That one's reliable. I won't have to, I won't have to question or wait on them to be with me. They'll just be with me. Make it mm -hmm. pretty, pretty simple criterion. Mm -hmm. Why would we do things simply? Let's make it as complicated as possible. Let's get, let's make everything weedy. Oh my gosh. Side note, for those of you guys that have heard Buck Brandon tell me, you're just overthinking it. How many times has he said that throughout the years? Mm -hmm. Not as much as he could have, right? But I just think it's, I feel so smug when I'm reading Tom's book and he's just like, if people would just stop and think more. I'm like, mm -hmm, that's what I've been trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> you have no comment? <laughs> well, no, my, my thought is, I wonder, because like, obviously you can, see and Buck talks about the the level on which it is a spiritual thing between him and the horse. It's more than just physically having them with him and being broke. It's it feeds your soul and all all this these different things. But his somewhat resistance to like describing it down to minutiae or putting words to it. Like 
you wonder what and there's no way we could get him to tell us this but you wonder what his internal journey has been that he like has he has he thought about it or just it's just happened over time you know has he how much reflection does he make on it or is it just kind of happened and it's there and you know how much does he push back on not talking about it and getting into the weeds even though he internally has gotten into those same weeds and thought about it that much and reflected on the spiritual connection to arrive at where he is now even though he's like not excited to overtly have that conversation or write it in a book or or whatever maybe one day we can convince him to do that but for right yeah. now yeah. julie yeah totally i always think of ray's book like duh think harmony with horses like come on hello read the first word but i think you're you're 100 michael true like just like everybody myself included um you know it's like i already thought about that i don't want to talk, talk about it now you know that was like many many years ago i don't want to think, i don't want i'm not into thinking about it right now and then other times of course he will be into just i'm sure like all the rest of us do mm -hmm. so but it is it is funny because that it, i think too unless you know i mean this is we got everyone here with us thinking about it you know, we're thinking out loud or sharing our thoughts as a you know the two of us but also with everyone else listening and participating and adding their thoughts and thinking about it with us right unless you have that you can kind of be having the thoughts but not expressing them they're not as overt or in conscious it's just the process is a little bit more internal and subconscious maybe because you haven't yeah. Through, yeah, process, sure. through the process been trying to put words to it to share the experience with someone else you know maybe it's just not your jam to be talking about it or you just in the process didn't have the community to gab about it so. and, and everything in its own time too right like there's an incubation period and there's like laying it all out and then there's interacting with people about it and then meanwhile you better be practicing it the whole time too because that, that's the other thing that tom said in his book it's he's like it doesn't mean that person has to stop what they're doing to think but they need to still stop and think mm -hmm. be thoughtful yeah exactly so the other thing michael that i was hoping that you would think about and and it would be great if we had a little bit of time in the next few days to talk about it as well because i really what i would like to do personally is um i'd like to put together some sort of a presentation for the gang around here like to connect i was i was popped in on some folks earlier in the week and um there were certain things that that is is surprising to me that folks haven't thought about that i would be happy to share so i'd like to put together just a short presentation less than a half an hour for folks and um i was talking to debbie about it the other day and i'm like i don't know what that would be you know something that something that i feel would be important to share and is not just but that has to come from from within in an organic way that isn't parroting that and yet you can't get away from the universal truth. So you're certainly gonna be saying things that other people have said. So without any of that garbage laid over the top, just what is it that I would want? What are the top few things, you know, that I would want to say, right? And so I was thinking about the myths. I should probably just hang it a little bit on three big myths in horsemanship going against, going off of our half truths thing. But this is what came to me this morning. So think about it a bit. But myth number one, horse training is about pressure and release. So I was telling one of the young girls earlier this week, I'm like, yeah, because her comment was, this horse doesn't understand pressure. 
I don't look. Every living thing understands pressure. But what, what are we trying to say is the larger picture, right? So yes, pressure and release, of course, that is a mechanism. But as I told her, she's young and like a sponge and her eyes were like humongous, you know, and I'm like, as quick as I said, that is like a caveman. She's like, I'm like, get through that as fast as you can. So to get bogged down in I'm using pressure and release or even positive reinforcement, again, super caveman like right so then the idea that goes with that is that feel should feel like something it doesn't feel like nothing it feels like something mm -hmm. right so myth number one pressure and release is how you do it myth number two desensitization is a good thing like people i feel like would benefit from at least having that presented as a possible myth, right? Like, oy vey. And the third myth would be... Oh. Disengagement is a good thing. Like, those are the, the obvious deals. So, surely that, that can, you know, then, then the ideas that would be interesting to talk about but that you could probably do 20 well, minutes okay but your your thing is when you've been saying myth well are you meaning by myth half truth or those two different things i guess that my general concept for the the top the name of the presentation would be the heart of horsemanship so so the myth being that horsemanship is about pressure and release boo no lame forget that. Number two, desensitization is a part of horsemanship. No, boo, that has nothing to do with it. Number three, disengagement has something to do with horsemanship. No, boo, get rid of that. Like those are all myths and we can myth bust those like that with just a little bit of thought and matching it up with our experience. Do you guys think, or is that too punchy? Too punchy. I'm just, yeah, 100%. Um, I, I was just, when you were saying myth, thinking you're... Meaning people think it's I, true, is I no, guess... Your, com your comments recently have been, you know, that's a half truth. Some of those myths that you just said are half truths. Pressure and release. It's just not the whole story. Disengagement isn't a half truth. It's... I mean, like, it's entirely different from a half to it. If you say yielding the hindquarters is a half truth, if by yielding the hindquarters you mean disengagement, but disengagement is not a half truth. It's a, you're in the raspberries, or in the, what do we call it, blackberries? What was this? Raspberries are much softer than blackberries. We don't have blackberries around here, so. Oh, geez. we have black. We have black raspberries, though. Oh yeah, those are good. Yeah. Very good. Very yeah. tough. Well, it's a lot. I think I, I. I was just saying, black raspberries are tiny. It takes a lot of them to even satisfy here. But anyway, that was totally beside the point. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so the myth, I guess, the reason I would also categorize the pressure and release into the myth category, although, although, you're a hundred percent right. It's a half truth. I guess the myth would be pressure and release, ta-da, or positive reinforcement, ta-da. It's like, no. <laughs> that, that's a myth. One, if you're subscribing to one or the other as like horse development or horsemanship, you know, that's a total myth. And if you've stopped, the point is, if you've stopped there and, you, and someone has told you that that is the arrival point, that's a, that's a myth. It's a bit weedy. In other words, mm -hmm. there's so much more than that. Yeah. So much more than like... that. And you are, I don't know, it becomes to what 
is your goal. Like if, if your goal is an obedient horse, I guess that's not a myth. That's just as far as you want to take it, right? Mm-hmm. And to you or I, I, that'd be like, really? That's, that's it? That's what you're after? And the, and it was so cool to watch this, this young gal, teenager, you know, just like you could just see it, the light bulb just go ding. No resistance, no, no nothing. Oh, oh. sure. Cause she's, she's into this, you know? So it's like, oh yeah, okay. It was so fun, you know? But yeah, that's why it would have to be, we would have to preface the entire discussion about that, that this is about horsemanship. And, you know, trying to get this presentation to be short and and valuable at the same time i'm thinking to myself self if you were gonna die in a month what is it that you would want to leave behind to have said and pressure and release is one of them because Yes, but duh. Uh, Oasis Equestrian said, not too punchy, fabulous and needed. <laughs> yes, not too punchy to uh, be thinking about and talking about and sharing, but Emma's way of going about it is a lot. <laughs> duh. I'll do it better. I'll do it better. I swear. Uh, I don't know if I. I don't know if leave that. (laughs) Do better. You have to show me that you can do better. We've had weeks and weeks of you being punchy and. I know. (laughs) Uh, I know it. And I'm a girl, and I'm little, and oh my gosh, it does not go over well. Jean said, you're asking them to not stop as an absolute, but those are springboards for growing your communication with your horse. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to write the presentation, send it to Jean, and you can fix it. There you go. Jean, that's right up Jean's alley. Yeah, totally. Okay, sound good. Good? Yeah, because see, look, she says it so nicely, rather than me being like, Duh. What, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. I think because I don't mean it that way, of course, but, but once again, this young girl is the one who inspired me because she, that is, she wanted someone to say that to her mm-hmm. and she was a hundred percent ready for it mm-hmm. and she had no resistance to it and she was like great and off she went so yeah. so i'm not talking about you know trying to jam it down anyone's throat that doesn't want to hear it mm-hmm. but if someone is like tell me what you're thinking about then this 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 is kind of critical not kind of like it is critical it absolutely is the game changer if you get stuck on pressure pressure and release you're not going to get what we're talking about if you are desensitizing your horse you're not going to get what we're talking about if you are disengaging your horse you are not going to get what we're talking about like that is the truth if you want what we're talking ha, about. Ha. Shall we be done since we're over 25 minutes? Oh, we are over. We're, oh, sorry, Julie. I'm supposed to be helping her work in the round <gasps> end right now. Oh, no. Cut Which Ju- Julie? Oh, gosh. Julie, oh. Uh, mm-hmm. And I have a lesson at 11, so... Sorry, my fault, my fault. I'm going to have to make it up to her uh, somehow. Sorry, sorry, sorry. To be fair, um, I didn't know that, but 
Yeah, her results with uh, Scarlett have just been so fun. Wow. Oh, in the last, she's been here for 10 days. She was house sitting. So she's been riding every day for the last 10 days. I don't know, did she send you a picture or video? Uh -huh. I mean, both, phenomenal yeah. changes in that horse from where she was a, a year ago. It's just like. Because, Julie, why wouldn't she change? She, well, of course, she wants to go like that. Yeah. You just had to show her how to do it. Pretty cool. All right, I gotta run. Okay, we'll see you guys next Thursday morning, 6 30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. 8 30 Central. Have a good week, everybody. See ya. Bye.